How's everybody doing? We're good? I was going to say first off that I um, work with teenagers a lot, so um, I am a firm believer in having conversations, and I know what it can feel like to throw your hand up in the middle of a speech, but I want you, if you have something you want to say, I have a question you want to ask, you want to challenge me on something, I love being challenged on things, um, and I'm used to teenagers throwing themselves out of their seats. Um, I've, I've seen literally it all. So if you have any questions, you want to know something, I've talked about something you want to know more about, just feel free to let me know and uh, we can talk a little bit more about it because like I said, I would much rather this be a conversation between myself up here on the stage and you guys. Yes. Your guys' insight is fantastic. So, um, like my introduction, uh, my name is Allie Behringer. I graduated here in 2012, so I've only been out for three and a half years. So. Apparently that's enough to give a symposium talk, so keep your hopes up because you can get there. If I can get there, you guys can certainly get there. Um, but uh, I really thought about what I wanted to talk about today. And I remember being at Augie and A, loving my experience, but also being really confused about what I wanted to do. And I remember everyone kept talking about different paths, and I'd be like, that's great, that sounds great, but what is my next step? I want to be like, give me one step I can take right now that I can figure out at least what may be next for me. Um, and, I, and I really think that's a conversation that you guys should be having with each other as well as people who have graduated. I think that's an important thing to talk about. So what does that have to do with research and practice? Well, um, we're going to interpret that a little bit. So uh, I feel a little bit like an imposter. There we go. Uh, I feel a little bit like an imposter. Um, raise your hand if you've ever heard of the imposter syndrome before. No? Okay. Oh, awesome. Okay. So I'm sure you've probably felt this feeling at some point, but they love to kind of hammer it into your brain when you go to graduate school. And the imposter syndrome is kind of this concept of why me? I don't really think I belong here or they made a mistake. So for example, um, it is my first year of graduate school and I've been waiting to go to graduate school and kind of prepping for it for these past few years. And um, you get there and you kind of feel like, okay, everyone's really smart. Everyone has great accomplishments, like I don't know. And you kind of think maybe another Allie Behringer applied to grad school at the same exact time I did. Maybe they switched the applications up. Maybe they got mine wrong and someday they're gonna come up to me and be like, you're out and the other other variants are dead, right? And it sounds absurd, but everyone to some extent has that feeling of, oh my gosh, like, I don't really know they're gonna find me out soon, right? They're gonna find out that I'm not as good at this thing as I said I was. And so, a lot of times, you know, we wanna think about our accomplishments and our skills and acknowledge those, that's fantastic. But I actually think the imposter syndrome and another concept that I really enjoy, the beginner's mind, and um, it's an Eastern philosophy of kind of having an open mind and going into whatever it is that you go into knowing that you're a beginner. And that way you can go in with more questions, take in more perspectives, um, go in with just more open mind, right? So I have found that kind of feeling like I'm lost has actually been a benefit to what I do. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I wanted to throw that out there for you first. So my path looks a little bit like this. Um, in three and a half years, I managed to have all of these jobs, and I promise, I like I said, people talk about the path and it's not linear, but I do want to throw out that sometimes there is strategy in the chaos, right? So a lot of the choices I made before going to grad school, um, yes, part of them were, I would say, luck or um, just kind of how my path went at that point, but a lot of them I did kind of try to put a little of um, intention into. So. Um, like I said, I was here at Augustine College until 2012, and um, I my class schedule looked a bit like this, right, all over the place. I found out that I was interested in youth development, so I wanted to work with youth. I knew that, right? Um, and so I, I started kind of delving into that topic and, and the kind of the adversities the youth face. Um, and I was like, okay, so I got psychology down under my belt. I always knew I wanted to do that. Well, then the, the other answer to all of the problems that we have must lie in sociology or anthropology, right? So I minored in anthropology, and I, I still didn't find all of the answers, right? I actually found I had more questions. So I, I delved into other fields, and I kept finding I was having more and more questions, and uh, that became frustrating for me. But I realized that actually was a benefit because I went into each subject with an open mind, being like, maybe this is where I'll learn more. And the more I learned, the less answers I had, but actually I felt like it enriched 
my ability to think of the topic in a, a more complex way. I think Arya does a fantastic job at that. So um, I'm going to go over just really quickly the jobs I had, not to like give myself a pat on the back in front of all of you guys, and I also won't bore you with complicated graphs and data and whatever. Um, that if I had it, maybe I would throw it your way, but I don't. But instead, I think it's important for you guys to kind of know a path that someone can take, and also um, I'm going to tell a few stories that I think <coughs> will be easier to relate to if I just tell you what I've done since I graduated and left Rock Island. So um, right when I graduated, Augustina, I went to DePaul University, and that confused a lot of people because people still ask me now, like, why did you drop out of grad school? So I didn't go to grad school at DePaul. I became a paid research assistant. Um, which I realized at some point I would need to know graduate school was the right step for me, if research kind of was the right next step for me. So I found myself in a community psychology department. Um, and I was like, this is it, right? Once again, I had that mindset of like psychology and community. This is going to give me all the answers. And um, so I go in fresh out of undergrad. I'm ready for my new experience. I've moved to Chicago. Um, and I, I grew up in central Illinois, so this was a completely kind of new new place for me, a new concept I had visited clearly, but never lived there. So I, I go into um, being a research assistant, and I worked on an NIH grant with about 200 women who had past criminal justice involvement at some point in their life where they currently were involved, or um, they also were struggling with substance abuse um, problems. So either they were in recovery, um, they had relapsed, some sort of kind of interaction with that. Um, and so most of the women were also middle-aged minority women from the south side of Chicago. And um, I come in like right out of Auburn, like ready, right? I have all of my foundation built, I'm ready for this. And I realized I was terrified, right? So the interviews are two and a half hours long. And I am about to sit in front of this other human being that I felt like at one point, what connection do I have? Like, what right do I have to ask these very sensitive questions? And so the first interview I had, I sat down and I realized that I just wanted to hear her story. Right? I wanted to know her story. So um, two and a half hours flew by and for the next year and a half, interviewing was one of my favorite aspects of that job. Um, I think a lot of times in research, we, we don't talk about the research assistance, which is something that could be a step for any of you after you graduate. And I think being a research assistant is fantastic because you actually get to hear the stories. You get to be in front of people. And once again, I kind of go back to that beginner's mind where I went in, and I, I just wanted to know more because I, I didn't know where this person was coming from, right? And so it was a community-based um, research project, and so I don't know how much you guys probably talk about that in courses, but it is uh, one way to, to run a study or to, to look at things, is allowing the community to have a say in what questions researchers ask, <laughs> even before they start asking them, right? So what do you think needs to be asked for people? What do you think the, the problems are? So um, I was there for about a year and a half, and while I was there, um, and all of these were part-time jobs, so I left off my time as a professional barista and a professional nanny. So that also happened. Um, because I won't lie to you, research doesn't pay a lot at all. So um, that's just a reality of it. So then um, I started realizing, okay, I, I really like this research thing. I love interviewing. It's something that I think I'm, I'm good at. Um, now I should do it with youth. I should jump into working with youth because I know that's the population I want to work with. So I found myself at the University of Illinois at Chicago on a very similar research study, but I was in a pu public health department. And I had no experience in public health, right? Um, but I found that it was very similar trends that they were seeing and they were uh, with youth involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, and so it was an HIV intervention but I, I had an additional task on this project in which I could facilitate the intervention we were studying. So the intervention was a two week long intervention and uh, the youth were mandated to places called ERCs in Chicago. So they're evening reporting centers. So uh, these youth have gotten in trouble in some capacity and uh, they go to the ERCs after school and then they stay there till about eight or nine and then they ship them home and they, they repeat that every single day, right? Um, and I had never been to a place like this, and so I go in with them, and um, I remember one of the first experiences I had where youth were coming in, and they were handing me a cord, and I was like, what? And then they were like, you need to plug me in. And I was like, I don't understand what that means or anything, and so during our whole facilitation, our whole interview, um, or sorry, during the intervention, they have to be plugged into walls because they're all on electric bracelet monitoring, right? 
And I remember the symbolism has never left me of that, right? I just didn't want to be, at some points I wanted to refuse and say, I'm not going to plug you into a wall because you are a human being, right? Um, but being in that environment with them, we would ask that all staff members leave, that we would have a space for them. And it was not only kind of a safe sex program because it was an HIV intervention, but we also did a lot of de-escalation of violence. A lot of our youth um, were well involved in gang activity in Chicago, had really complex trauma in their background, either exposure to violence or um, being involved with violence themselves. And um, this is kind of where I found my passion, right? I was in a place that I never expected I would be. Uh, if I had gone to graduate school right after Augie, I probably wouldn't have been studying a topic like this. But it really spoke to me in these moments, and because um, youth are really good at calling you out if you're not genuine. I think if anyone's ever worked with a teenager, they will let you know any moment that they don't agree with anything you're saying, doing, wearing, whatever it may be, right? And so um, I think my mentality of I'm a beginner at this, I don't know what I'm doing, really meshed well with their mentality of, we want to we want to pick apart why you're here and what you're doing, and I think it became a good relationship between trying to be genuine and figure each other out. Um, and so I also would follow the youth for a year. Um, I called myself the very friendly uh, child stalker, which sounds very creepy, but retention rates are really important in research. So I would uh, we would check in with them three times throughout the year after the intervention, and we would do like a two-hour assessment with them. So I would need to go find them in the community, you know, call their parents, show up at their house. Um, I'm sure lots of feelings got bigger and sick of me up for a while. Um, and then I uh, made a move. I, I stayed there and did some part-time work in Cook County Jail. So um, I, uh, that was just, as you can assume, a, a whole new life experience, um, being in the jail. And I, I realized that I was in probation sites. I was working with individuals that had some sort of interaction with the criminal justice system. But uh, I had really no right to, to speak their stories or to talk about things if I myself didn't have some interaction with the jail itself, right? Um, so my experience clearly is very different being a data manager, but I kind of got to be flying on the wall because the minute I said I was a data manager, usually people's eyes glazed over, they just didn't care anymore, right? So I kind of got to, to walk around and um, I worked in a women's mental health unit, so it looked a little bit different than what you would assume. It was more residential, there was actually a lot of fantastic programming, um, things like that. So. Um, I was there for a bit, and then my last year in Chicago, I it was like, okay, so I've done the research thing, I know it's for me, um, I need to do a bit of drug, drug service, or at least some more programming that I think is important. And I also just love interacting with youth daily, so I said, this is for me. Um, and it was my first full-time job, guys. And I just left it, which is so sad. But um, I was at a agency in Oak Park, Illinois, so right outside of Chicago, and um, it's a really small domestic violence agency. There's only about 25 to 30 employees, and uh, it's called Sarah's Inn, and um, I was a violence prevention specialist, so I was in the classroom with youth every day, uh, building curricula around dating violence. So we would talk about things from consent to dating violence to healthy relationships, anything you can imagine, and of course, that's why I said you guys could just do anything right now and I'd probably be used to it, because when you're talking about fun topics like those, lots of stuff comes up. So I really enjoyed the challenge of that experience, and we saw about 3,000 youth in that, that year's time. So we saw a lot, of, a lot of teens around Chicago. And then here I am now at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I'm in Human Development and Family Studies, so it's kind of a hybrid program. Uh, there's a lot of people from psychology, uh, developmental kind of path, um, there's people from sociology, from all over, kind of coming together saying, we believe a lot of these problems we're seeing within families and youth and really just societal problems in general are more complicated than one using one lens, using one field to see things. And I blame Argustina for my endless curiosity and always being like, but there could also be this or this. So um, it actually ended up being a fantastic program for me. And I also work part time at a um, local nonprofit called Briar Patch Youth Services, and I do youth youth restitution work on the weekends on Saturdays. I spend every Saturday with them, and we go out and we do community service to pay back the state or the city for whatever crime they may have committed. They may have committed, um, and it's really fantastic because it's actually a way of kind of them interacting in the community and still. Um, being able to like pay off whatever happened, but maybe in a more positive way and having positive interactions with community members. So um, it's pretty great. But long story short, why I tell you that is um, I think it is important. 
I think it was important to talk about research and practice divide. And what I just said, it might be a little confusing why it's important to talk about this, but this is something that has really come my way as I've been working through this path of my own. It's something I've really noticed, especially now being back in academia. It's something I wasn't as aware of being at Augustana because we have such a fantastic institution here, right? And I'm not saying other institutions aren't fantastic. I think it's just here we really work in collaboration, right? So uh, let's just think about it this way. So if you imagine in your head a, uh, if I said a, a medical lab scientist or something like that, right? Um, and then I say a local family physician. Um, maybe both are working for similar populations. Both are driven and professional and um, they're looking for similar solutions. Okay? But both, for me personally, bring up a bit of a different image. So when I think of a, if I thought of an academic, a high institution academic um, lab scientist working towards maybe a medical cure or something like that, I think of someone maybe in a, in a lab coat um, really excited about data, right? Like really excited. Like complicated graphs, test tubes, all those things. And then I think when I kind of envision the image of a local family physician, I think of this person, um, I think that the title says it all, right? Local, so someone that you know, knows you and your community, someone who uh, is dedicated towards the people they work with, the day-to-day -day interactions they have. Um, and both of those might be stereotypical images, right? But the problem is that we see people think that they have to make this decision based on kind of those stereotypical images. So I remember being like, I can't go into research. And uh, Dan Ports is sitting right over there. And I was petrified of research, right? Petrified. I was like, when I was at Augie, I was like, I just want to do all community stuff. Like, I just want to do, like, you know, I want to go into the social work path. Like, that's what I want to do. Um, and the more I realized that research was just a, a different way of looking at the problems that I wanted to do, um, with people individually, and it was strategic, and I loved that. I loved kind of viewing it as a puzzle and realizing that if you thought about something critically and through a few different lens, you could do a research project on it. So it became really exciting for me. Um, but here's another example of kind of the gap, is that last year, I believe, um, National Institutes of Health funded medical research for around $30 billion in taxpayer money, right? Um, so there's a lot of money that goes into to research. And um, we also know that a peer-reviewed, published journal article that I'm sure everyone here has had to search for, right, um, ha is usually read on average by 10 people. So that means that the, public, the paper I just found out that I am getting published, 50% of the readers are probably my family, and 50% of the readers are probably the people who wrote the paper with me. So, I mean, things get out there, they do, but there is a gap. Right? And we even think about, if you're watching any of the debates recently, right? when topics are talked about, sometimes I look at the screen and I'm like, where are the experts? We have some of the most brilliant minds in our nation doing fantastic things, right? And we hear things happening and we see policy decisions being made and really impacting people. And we know that it's not necessarily the best path for people. Um, but we still see those decisions being made. And it's because there's this gap between this kind of this image of high level research and the ivory tower in the institution, right? And then we see people on the ground level doing the work with people in the community. And there's a gap between that. And it doesn't always have to be that, right? Right? We have evidence-based practice that social workers use that is based on research. But it's not always as easy as that. So what I really thought about giving or talking about with you guys was having three steps that I think are really important that have really impacted me. I'm realizing that regardless of if you go one way or another, that there's things that you should do as a professional that regardless of your path or kind of closing that gap, that will make you successful at what you do or at least help you along that path okay? that I see kind of happening because of this. So step one is break out of your bubble. So I love this photo. I took this of two kids. It was a really hot night in Chicago and two kids were playing um, playing in the water. And um, I, like you guys have probably already grasped, I love Chicago. I love working with youth in Chicago. I think they are phenomenal. Um, and so when I think of the Augie bubble, um, I know we all use the term in endearing sense, and I love it too, right? I was exactly the same, and I am the same. Today, when I was talking to a colleague at 
uh, University of Wisconsin, and I was like, I can go to every building and know exactly where I'm going, and I see people like, no, and it's really great. Um, and that's a fantastic part of it, right, is that you can feel comfortable and there's a great community here. Um, but there is also a community outside of the bubble. And um, one thing that I was shocking was that Augustana is, is kind of one of a kind in the Quad Cities, right? But there's so much out there that we can get our hands on and that we can learn more about the community. But I think it also is another form of education for all of us is that we learn just as much through that. So um, working in Cook County Jail, working in the ERCs with, uh, with youth, uh, I immersed myself in a community that I knew nothing about and it taught me that. Right. So as the researcher, maybe I wasn't collecting data on my day-to-day -day experience, but I was as a person. And that was going to impact how I viewed things in the future and how I decided to study things in the future. And I think that's a really important part of it, is breaking out of your own bubble. Um, a story I like to, like to think about is when I was uh, here at Augustina, I had a part-time job with the Girl Scouts, so I became a Girl Scout at like 20 years old again. Um, and I was an outreach education person, so I would work with groups of girls uh, who didn't maybe have the opportunity to have like a traditional troop or whatever it may be. So we talk about different topics and do projects, whatever. Um, and so one day we asked, uh, draw a picture of a place that you really want to go. And one girl drew the Eiffel Tower. And I was like, oh cool, like that's great. Um, I was like, I've been lucky enough to go to France and it's beautiful. Um, the next girl, it was a picture of a bridge. And I remember I was like, oh okay, you know, usually when you get like artwork from a, a young one, you're like, oh, tell me more about this beautiful, because I don't know what it is. Um, and so she explained to me that it was uh, the bridge over to Illinois, and that she had always wanted to come to Illinois. And I remember being like, we're like 10 minutes over to that bridge right now. And it was kind of a reality check in which I could decide where my bubble was at all times, right? I could stay here if I wanted. I could jump into another bubble for a little bit and come back. And that was my privilege, being able to acknowledge that I could decide what that looked like. But I realized that there was other people wanting to know more about my community, and they didn't necessarily have the capability to do that, and I did. So it was kind of a reality check in which I was like, okay, I need to learn more, because it's not only just these silos, it's people thinking about one another in these different bubbles, but not taking the time to understand the reality of what their community is like. So the same thing happened in Chicago, literally almost the same story. I was working with some youth, and one of the boys pulled me aside, and he's like, you live on the north side, right? And I was like, yeah, I do. Um, kind of, if anyone knows Chicago, I was like up in the, the Lakeview, DePaul area when I was working there. Um, and I was living there at that time, and I was like, yeah, I live on the north side. And he was like, oh, okay, cool. Like, uh, someone told me the other day that people just like look like they're, they're happier there or something like that. And I was like, yeah, no, it's about the same. And, and I was talking to him about that, and I was like, he probably never gets to the north side, right? I mean, it's not only just like a really long trip and, and sometimes really complicated, but I realized that I had the ability every night then to drive back to the north side to people that looked like me, talked like me, and I decided what my bubble looked like, right? And he was trying to understand a little bit of what my bubble looked like, and once again, I was kind of hopping around, and I realized that I needed to learn more about the places that I was just hopping into. And so I needed to break out of that bubble, but that also meant inviting people into my world and learning more about them. So I think that that's really important, and I encourage you guys to do more of that here. I mean, working at a nonprofit, I know if you just called one up and said, do you have a little work I could do? I mean, not only is it great for your professional development, but there are so many places in the QC that need that help. Um, second is find your voice. So I am a firm advocate, and I... Um, I know that there's kind of that perception of the researcher, right, being kind of that cold, um, unemotional person. Um, and I'm not talking about like our faculty here because they're fantastic, right? And they're all researchers too. Um, but sometimes you have the image of this like this kind of researcher that does this uh, well millions of dollars for their projects, right? And, and they don't have a lot of interactions with people. And, and why did they get into it? And they're objective. And um, researchers, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a secret. Researchers are also humans too, right? So they got into it for a reason. Maybe some forget why they got into it, but they got into it for a reason. And they're looking at a piece of the puzzle in a different way. So they're looking at the solution in a different way. Um, but I think that we can also break down that, that barrier a little bit because I do think it can be a problem. So I would encourage you to find your voice. Um, I found my voice when um, I became, I tried to become more self-aware. And I think that is something that sounds really simple, but it can be really hard for, for people to do. Um, like I said, acknowledging that I've gone to communities and I didn't know anything, 
I didn't know how to talk to people about certain things and realizing that I was coming from a certain place and there were so many perceptions about me that I needed to be aware of and check my own before I could tell someone's story. And so that was something I really worked on in finding your own voice. Um, I encourage that you write down things that you're passionate about. Um, you just think about the things you're passionate about. And that sounds silly, but talk to your friends about the things you're passionate about because that is really important, I would say. At least being able to advocate for yourself and for others is finding that voice. Um, and I, I still have a hard time sometimes with it. I, the other day, I was working with a youth and I was taking him home and um, it was after a work team, after we had done like community service and I was taking him home. And all day he had been hood up, mumbling, um, just not engaged. And, and that, was, that was kind of his normal demeanor. And, um, and so it was fine and you, I never try to push. I don't want to push anyone and I, I wait, if he wants to talk to me, he'll talk to me. So um, during the day, he had said, like, why do you on your Saturdays work with bad kids? And I, I've heard this numerous times from them, and I, it breaks my heart every time because I think that they are just like every other kid makes mistakes, right? All kids make mistakes. Some teenagers do. Some have the privilege of not always being caught, and some have the privilege of um, when they are caught, not the, the same consequences, right? So um, we talked a little bit about that, and then in the car, I asked him, like, hey, you know, what's going on? I was like, I'll just try. I was, where, where did that come from? Like, what were you thinking about today? And so he took his hat off, or his, his hood off, and he looked at me, and he said, um, did you know that I'm treated different because of the pigment of my skin? And I remember, once again, that's one of those moments where I was just taken back, and I was like, um, I kind of was ashamed of myself for a moment because I was like, once again, I was just like, he's angry today. He doesn't want to talk. And I realized that everyone is struggling with their own realities, right? And he is this creative intelligent, perceptive person, probably way beyond his years, and sadly so because he's had to deal with a lot of things none of us probably would have to deal with at certain points. Um, and he looks at me and he says, you sometimes go to the Capitol, right? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, you tell those politicians, and you see them, you tell them my story. Like, you tell them that I'm trying. You tell them what I'm doing. And I, I wish it wasn't the case that I could have been like, you come with me next time, because I, I know the reality at this point. But my goal um, in kind of this concept of research justice is finding a way to create a platform so I can take a step back and that the people that I know want to use their voice, this one boy who wants to use his voice, can use his voice. And it's not mine instead. Because I get sick of hearing my own voice anyways. And I think those are brilliant. So if, I can, if we all can use our voices to create some platform for change, I think that, that is a great step. And also great for your professional development. All right. Last one. Tell a story. So I've been telling stories. Um, and I love, um, does anyone know Brene Brown? You should look her up, she's awesome. Um, she's one of those cool researchers, right? I know that sounds like it can't be possible. But she uh, is a, a researcher that studies emotion, uh, vulnerability, shame, things like that. And the first time I had interviewed him, his mom was home and she was fantastic and had fantastic stories. I remember like, after his assessment, we sat around a little bit and chatted and, um, and they were really close and he, um, it was like getting late, so he asked if he could walk my assessor and I outside to our car. So he walked us out to our car, we got in the car, we drove back, end of that story. And um, six months later, we go back, and I'm like standing on his porch, and I ask his mom, I was like, oh, you know, it's time for his next assessment, like it's been six months, you know, I have my, I usually have like two laptops strapped across me, I look like crazy researcher style. Um, and she was like, you know what, I haven't seen him today, he hasn't been home a lot. And um, she's like, he's been hearing his name a lot. And it's worrying me just because I feel like people are talking about him and he's in danger. And so we talked about that for a minute. And I just said, when he comes home, you know, just let me know. Um, and we'll try to meet up with him and maybe to a safer place if that's better for him. Um, and then I was actually on my way home that evening uh, back to my hometown. And I got a phone call. And he had come home a few hours later and was walking up his steps to his porch and then was shot and killed in the head, like on the porch that we were sitting on earlier that day. And my first reaction was I thought of my social work friends, my teacher friends, everyone who is invested in youth lives more than the small interaction I had with this one youth and loses a youth to something like that, right? Um, I know those friends would have a physical reaction to hearing these statistics. Um, and then this happened and I realized in our story, in our research, he would be a number. There would be a, a note somewhere that would say, you know, we lost this many youth during the, the cycle of the project. Um, and then once again, the next day in the media, they spelled his name wrong, and all it said was just gang-related. 
Okay. They didn't tell the story of how he was in a program to um, get his GED, how he was very aware that he was trying to take measures to be safer, um, that he was an incredibly funny and intelligent and creative human being, right? And there was no mention of an honor roll or nothing, right? Nothing about his character, it just was gang related, and they spelled his name wrong. So there's two different kinds of stories, and then there's his story, the real story. But that's not the story that's usually told, right? And so I think we make a, a decision on, I've realized that advocacy in the research realm is that I've had the privilege to be in spaces that maybe he wouldn't. So maybe I can go up to the Capitol in, uh, in Madison, where I go to school, and you know, tell someone a story, and it might have an impact on them. But people are affected by stories that impact them. And the problem with that, the problem with that, the beauty with that is that people relate that to their, to their community, their sense of community, right? So if you hear a story about your community or something that touches you personally, it's going to have a larger impact. Numbers will even have a larger impact on you. But if it's a community you've never had an interaction with, if you never broke out of that bubble or found a way of talking about it or shared a story, then it probably won't have that same effect on you or others that you're talking to about it. So I think all in all, that's to say that um, that these three steps are three things that I've been really working on and I think have been really helpful and I wish I had honed in on them even more so when I was in undergrad. Um, I, I wish I had broken out of the bubble more, right? I had a few internships and things like that, but I never thought maybe I could just like call up an agency and ask if I can shadow for a day or if I can just volunteer and, and work with their youth. I thought it had to be for credit, right, an internship and I know Augustina is more than willing to hook anyone up even a day of shadowing but you have to be able to take that step to ask for help to break out of that bubble. Um, find your voice. So find what is passionate for you and have others learn more about it by telling a story. But you have to be aware of the stories you're telling. The stories I tell um, are nothing like my own background and my own story. And so I have to be very careful and I want the youth that I work with to challenge me every day on the way I tell their stories because um, once again, we're gonna work together to get to a point where they can tell them themselves. So I want to make sure I'm authentically kind of telling that story, being genuine about it, and doing something like that. Um, in graduate school, it's not encouraged uh, to have a, a second job or even a part-time job, but at this point, I am a firm advocate of I have no right to speak or even study a population of people that I'm not being challenged by every day. So, um, yeah. so I guess that's kind of my spiel. I, I have this puzzle piece up here because I think um, I think we always think of research or direct service or different fields as the answer to a solution, right? So a new researcher will find the cure to that disease. Um, or social workers are the ones on the ground level individually impacting someone. But I think it's important to remember that if we all come together as puzzle pieces and try to find a solution, then that is going to be much more effective uh, than just doing it individually. So, yeah, I think that's all I said. That's my email right there. Um, I anyone can literally email me at any point. If you have any questions or anything, and then um, I guess this is a Q and A at this point. Um, so I would love to hear any questions, even if there's no question that's stupid, simple, anything like that. Believe me, once again, that beginner's mindset. I I think asking those questions are great. So questions. Who wants to go first? <laughs> ask you. He'll find you. He'll like come out and make you ask a question. This one that made you guys move up a little bit. I have a question. How did you find these opportunities in Chicago? Because I know a lot of our students say, wow, that sounds great. We had all these great things, but how do I find it? Where do I go? Right. Okay. Um, so when I first found a job um, at DePaul, um, I applied to a lot of them starting in like December or January um, and that's after I had talked to Dan Courts about kind of what my path was going to look like after and so I started applying to research jobs but um, connections are fantastic also being realistic so I always tell the story of um, how, how Courts was like okay great you got the job that's awesome so what is going to be your second job because Chicago is expensive and you need you know another job so I think uh, Finding someone who can be a mentor, but also very realistic about how you're gonna make it work is the way to still do something that you're passionate about. Because I know I had um, I had good friends who were very passionate about certain topics, but couldn't either find a job in it 
or um, didn't know how to make it work. And so it's really good to kind of be strategic when you go into it. Like I said, I didn't have a full-time job until the year before I went to graduate school, but there was ways of making it work. You just kind of gotta, gotta look around. And once you get immersed in one, there's people who know people. The whole networking thing, it's actually a real thing. So just always smile, be kind, and usually just bug people. That's a fantastic way of doing it. Bug people constantly, and sometimes they'll give you a job, so it's good. Emily, I thought it was really good. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, I kind of had the same experience as a graduate student um, when I was doing my PhD, that I was um, still involved clinically. My field is in hearing loss, audiology, and so several of my committee members, um, advisors, did not want me to be doing any clinical work at the same time as doing my PhD. But I found, for me, it was a very important fit to fuse those two, the research and the clinic, um, those were two worlds that, again, like you talked about, are oftentimes separated, but it's very important, I think, that we bring those, um, those worlds together. So I was kind of wondering, going forward, what do you think you're going to do, or do you have you thought about, you know, after graduate school, which I know is, you know, that's a really long ways off, even when you're in the middle of it, but what are some ways or things you can do um, going forward, or even could help our students to think about to continue to bridge this gap between those um, the research and the you know everyday practice. Awesome, that's an awesome question. So um, that was that was really big for me. Looking for a graduate program, so taking time off. Um, I found an advisor who's been in my department for thirty years, and um, so he's he's made his mark, right? And he uh, also has an extension appointment, which is something at the University of Wisconsin, in which they have a whole network of extension specialists who work out in the community in Wisconsin, and the community. Um, this extension network in the university itself has like a collaboration. So I knew he would at least have quite a bit of connections out in the community and be, you know, hopeful that that would be, be good. But um, I remember I was interested in applying to clinical psychology programs for a while too. Um, and I, I remember reading up a lot that it said like, but whatever you do, do not say you're interested in clinical work. And I remember being like, okay, but it's a clinical psychology program. And people said, Right, but also don't maybe say you're good with people, it's kind of cliche, and things like that. I know there's other ways to word it, but um, I think if that feels wrong to you, then don't apply to that program, right? And if they reject you, then that's okay. Because if, uh, I don't want to challenge the entire <laughs> higher educational system, but I think if we all challenge it, um, I think that there's ways in which we can make it relevant and current. Um, my advisor right now has a, a website for parents, and we post a blog each week and it's a blog post that's based on research that's done, but we write it in a way that a parent can easily read it in five minutes and get two or three tips from it um, and walk away and, and apply it to their real life. And I think that's also really important that if researchers more so are willing to do things like look how popular TED Talks are, right? So that if people talk for 10 minutes about a certain topic, because we know our attention spans go very quickly, um, that there would be more of that bridging the gap so that there would be less of kind of that uninformed conversation happening in the middle between the two. Um, because we also could learn a lot from practitioners. And I don't think sometimes research is willing to go to practitioners and say, okay, are we, what we're doing, is it even making a difference for you? Um, yeah. And so what am I going to do? That was actually the real question. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, I, I would love to end up at an institution like Augustana, but I think that there is a lot in the, in the policy realm um, that I would like to be involved with, just because I think the conversation uh, can be really positive um, with some policymakers who are willing to hear research. It just needs to be broken down concise and quick. And so I think that if the time is taken to do that, then we can really make a difference for people. Any other questions? Student questions. Yeah. My favorite color. Um, I have a dog. Um, yeah. Okay, great question. Um, so like I said a little bit, I decided on, so for the PhD program, I, I, you pick an advisor. This was something I learned. I actually didn't know you, you pick an advisor, someone you want to work with, and then apply to them while you're applying to the program. So for a long-term program, you look for someone who is going to be your mentor for the next five years. And of course, there's ways out of that if it doesn't work out, right? Um, but for the most part, that's the person you're agreeing to doing your research with for the next five years. Um, 
for the PhD program. So um, that was huge for me, was that I needed to make sure it was a good fit. Uh, and I will tell you the truth, I went to Wisconsin and it just felt better than the rest, right? It, my advisor has a sense of humor. I think it's great that researchers can step back and laugh at themselves when things get tough and serious. Um, and so it's also a, a, a program that's right down the street from the Capitol, so I think that there's a lot going on. Uh, it's been hard leaving Chicago, I'll admit that, but um, I think every community has its struggles, and so there's a lot to be done anywhere you find yourself. Um, you just gotta kinda look around for it, but yeah. Yeah, if you have any questions about grad programs or the process, um, I know most of the faculty in this room can speak to the, how many emails they receive from me about everything, but I feel like I have a pretty good grasp on like all of graduate school, at least applying to it, so. And they usually said, like, you know, um, are you good at stats? Are you good at theory? Like, what are you good at? But no one just said, like, what skill do you have? And I remember this faculty member said, okay, that makes sense. And it was one of the first people that had said, like, that makes sense, right? Instead of saying, why are you not doing direct service? Um, and, like, I think my story says that, like, I, I think it's a skill that I really worked on because I think it needs to be brought into the research realm. I, realm. I think we're losing a lot of brilliant minds that might love research, but they think it's not for them because the path looks too different from what they want, but I think that that can change. Um, so I think that that's one thing that I think some students deserve is a, some skills maybe being um, acknowledged more than others um, is hard on some people, but I think, uh, once again, feeling like that imposter, I kind of enjoy not letting that go because I think the minute I feel like I fit in is the minute I'm not challenging some structure that I think needs to change in some way, right? All structures and systems that we operate in need to change in some way. So if I feel like I fit in, then then I'm not probably doing my job right. So, or at least that's what my mother would say. She'd say I challenge everything to detail. So, good question. Anybody else? Anyone thinking between like going to grad school or taking a year off or taking time off? Is that like a, a thing that's happening? I know that that was a big question. To tell you the truth, I actually studied abroad my senior year, and I was so happy enjoying that that I was like, I could wait another year for graduate school. I don't even want to apply. And that was a blessing in disguise that that happened because then I ended up taking, you know, three off. So that was a great amount of time. Thank you guys. Oh, one more. Well, luckily, my department title is so long that I can't even just say psychologist. I can say like human developmental and family study. So I'm going to consider myself like a hybrid, I think, um, which is what my program produces. So some people go into policy, some people go into to practice still, even after a PhD and things like that. Um, I think it'll probably be um, policy and then and then teaching, but wherever the road leaves me. I, I would love to someday, my dream actually, my, my one of my dreams is to open a bakery. There's one in Chicago called the Blue Sky Bakery. I'll give it a shout out. They employ youth that have been involved in the system. They have an internship program. They learn how to bake. They like put on catering events and they hold talks with local professors about social justice and the youth are involved in that. And then their next step is placing them in another internship after that. So it's also kind of a really secret dream is to do something like that. But maybe on the side somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys.